Hey everybody, what's up? This is Nick. Uh, real quick, I want to play a little game with you guys. I want to play two recordings uh, with a pilot and ATC, and each recording is from a different pair of headsets. And I want you, based off the clarity of the message and recording, to guess how much each headset was. So let's hear headset one first. Swing 294 Juliet Yankee, go out to the ground on a 27 right, taxi via Alpha Delta, cross on a 35. 27 right via Alpha Delta, cross 35. Okay, that was headset one, and now let's hear headset two. Number 7462 Mike, runway 27 right, taxi via Charlie. 62 Mike, going to Sky Harbor. Number 62 Mike, Roger. All right, Sky Harbor via Charlie, 62 Mike. All right, so what did you guess? Well, if you would have guessed a $1,200 pair of headsets for recording number one, you would have been right. But if you were to have guessed a $1,200 pair of headsets for recording number two, you would have been way off. Recording number two was actually recorded with Core Aviation KA-1 headsets, which are $200. And this is why Core Aviation headsets are my favorite pair of headsets to recommend to students. I've had mine for nine years. They've never broken down on me. And when you compare the clarity to that $1,200 pair of headset clarity, they really can't be beaten. And for right now, up until May 10th, they are partnering with Part-Time Pilot for a 20% off coupon code. It's just Part-Time Pilot 20 to get 20% off on checkout. Just enter that into the coupon field on checkout, and you get 20% off an already great and affordable pair of headsets. So go ahead and check that out with the link in the show notes. <laughs> Hello and welcome in. Tomorrow is Halloween, so happy Halloween, everybody. My name is Nick Smith, and this is the Audio Ground School podcast. How's everybody doing? Hopefully, you are going to have a good time, whether it's handing out candy, taking your kids around, dressing up, going to a party, whatever. Hopefully, you're safe and have a good time on Halloween. I'm excited for it, and uh, yeah, so I believe, yeah, this should be dropping the day before Halloween, so. Those listening should be right around Halloween for you guys. This episode is going to be section two of our step one online ground school course. So when you join our private pilot membership, you get a bunch of courses and we do things in kind of steps and courses. We organize everything by courses. So step one is just going to be your online ground school. It's going to be all the lessons, you know, the written lessons, video lessons, audio lessons. You can choose whichever one you like kind of thing. The quizzes in there, the AI chat instructor thing in there. All that stuff in there, you get through all of that. Then you go on to step two where we have, you take some practice tests and we give you a custom report based off the results of that practice test. And that's kind of our endorsement process. We either give you your endorsement or have you take some more practice tests, but we give you practice as many practice tests as you'll need anyways, plus our flashcards. But that's how we organize everything. So we're inside the step one online ground school course. And section one was kind of just an introduction. Section two, we get started on the content. That's operation of aircraft systems. Last week, we did an aircraft overview, kind of an equipment overview of what's on an aircraft. And then today, we're going to talk about flight controls. Now, before we get to that lesson, I just have a couple announcements. One of them is one you will be interested to hear is our next $1,000 scholarship. So we do four scholarships per year. We try to do one every single season, right? Winter, spring, summer, fall. So the fall one, we're getting a little close to winter, but still fall. And we're going to do that on November 20th is going to be the deadline for our $1,000 scholarship. So all you have to do is you just have to be a member of our online ground school. Once you become a member in that welcome email, there will be a link to apply. It's just a Google form. It's a really short application. So you just have to apply, read the directions on that application, make sure you do all the directions on that application. And you're good. And if you don't have that welcome email, it's also in your membership page. So from your dashboard, you just click on my membership, you click on your ground school membership, and then you just scroll down and the link will be there as well. Or you can reach out to us at team at parttimepilot.com. So the deadline is November 20th for that $1,000 scholarship. And we also give out free ground school to a runner up. 
So yeah, November 20th, make sure you get your applications in before then. The other announcement is we released a new book. It's called The Ultimate Private Pilot Flashcard Book. So we have came out, we've had a flashcard PDF for a long time inside the bonus downloads course of our online ground school. And then we, about a few months ago, we made a digital flashcard feature inside the ground school. So people can just you know, do some flashcard practice and it randomly grabs a hundred questions. You can see instantly whether you got it right and the explanation for why the answer is what it is. It'll just grab a hundred random questions from our over, gosh, I don't know how many we have in private pilot, but it's like 1200 or so questions in our question bank. We have that same thing for our IFR ground school. We have the digital IFR uh, flashcards as well. But a lot of people, and I was like this, they like to have something physical to study. Maybe throw it in your flight bag, be able to do it you know, offline. Maybe you don't have internet where you're at. Maybe you're on an airplane, right? You want to read something on an airplane. You want to work on something not on your phone, like before your flight lessons or something, study something up. So I was thinking about making some flashcards, right? And there's a lot of private pilot flashcards out there, but I really don't like, and you know, I've done flashcards to study in the past and you always get a box of them. They're always these like loose flashcards and they're not very portable, right? It's like a big bulky box. You got to take out the flashcards and like they're all individually. You might lose them. They might get individually bent or something like that. So I thought it would be a cool idea to have a relatively small book and just have nothing but private pilot questions to practice for the FA written. So it's the ultimate flashcard book. It's about 600 pages there's three questions per page, and on the back is the answer and the explanation, and it's literally just over 850 questions, and that is on Amazon. I'll put that link in the show notes for you guys. It's now on Amazon. If you guys want something physical to study and take with you, throw it in your flight bag. That is the new Part-Time Pilot Ultimate Private Pilot Flashcard book, and I believe, let me see what the price is. The, I use Amazon to do my self-printing, like printing on demand, it's called. So it just makes things a lot easier. I don't have to buy a bunch of books in bulk and like store them somewhere and do the shipping or worry about the shipping or anything like that. So it's easy, but it's also a little bit more expensive to print. So because of that, and I'm not making a ton of profit on these, but because it is, you know, over 600 pages for Amazon to print, it is, the price is $28. I was hoping to make it about $20, but because of the cost and then because Amazon takes like 40%, another drawback of using them. But it's really easy. Everyone has Amazon, they ship really fast. So it's not too bad, $27.99 is the price. But again, I'll put that link in the show notes if you wanna check that out. And yeah, so that two announcements, the, the scholarship, again, November 20th, and then our new flashcard book. So we also have the Ultimate Private Pilot Test Prep book, which has great reviews on Amazon. So if you want more study material you know, that's physical, on Amazon, you can check out the Ultimate Private Pilot Test Spread book as well. All right, so without further ado, let's get to today's episode. So here we are with section two, lesson two on flight controls. The primary flight controls of an aircraft allow you to climb, descend, bank, crab, side slip, take off, land, and fly straight and level. The major components of the aircraft that allow you to make these maneuvers and that are considered the primary flight controls are the ailerons, the rudder, and the elevator and or the stabilator, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. The effectiveness of each control surface increases with speed because there is more airflow over them. Again, we'll talk more about this in the aerodynamics lessons and that section on aerodynamics. Secondary flight controls are things like flaps, trim, and spoilers. We will discuss each of these, each of the primary flight controls and the secondary flight controls in this lesson. Now, we've updated this lesson to include the distinguishing of primary flight controls and secondary flight controls because we are seeing sometimes the FAA written exam asks about that, you know, the distinguishing between what are primary flight controls and what are secondary flight controls. So remember, primary flight controls are ailerons, rudder, and elevator slash stabilator. Secondary flight controls are things like flaps, trims, and spoilers. Before I explain how each works, we need to understand the three axes of movement of an aircraft. Those three axes are the roll, 
axis, the pitch axis, and the yaw axis. Roll is the aircraft's movement or rotation about the Z axis. And the Z axis, if you can see in the figure, if you're in the online ground school, you can see this figure. If not, I will post this video. We've made a YouTube video on this, and I'll post that in the show notes. But the Z axis is the axis that goes straight through the fuselage. So if you're sitting in the aircraft, it'll go like through your back and then through your belly, out the nose of the aircraft, and then also the opposite direction, you know, through your belly, through your back, through the tail of the aircraft and out the back. So that's the Z axis. So through the nose and out the tail. And then roll is the movement around that axis. So if that axis is like a stick, you can imagine like a stick and then you say you like a roasting stick and then you put a marshmallow on that and the marshmallow is your aircraft. And then you rolled that stick, right? You rolled it in your hand left and right. That's like roll when that stick kind of rolls left or right. Now pitch is the aircraft's rotation about the x-axis. Now the x-axis goes through the wings. So it goes out one wingtip and out the other wingtip. And pitch is the rotation about that. So then if you were to, again, let's say you had a marshmallow aircraft and you were to stick a stick, a roasting stick through the wings, and then you were to roll that stick, right? The aircraft would pitch up and the nose and tail would go up and down because you'd be rolling it about the wings. And that's the pitch axis or the X axis. And then yaw is the aircraft's rotation about the Y axis. And the Y axis is the vertical axis. And that goes, you know, if you're sitting in the cockpit and you're sitting right on the CG, the yaw axis would go through your head upwards and then through your butt downwards, right? So it's vertically straight through the fuselage around about the area of the wings. So again, if we had a marshmallow aircraft and you just from the top of the aircraft, you stuck your roasting stick through it, and then you were to rotate that left or right, the nose of the aircraft would turn to the right or turn to the left and the tail would follow, right? So that's the yaw, if you can visualize that. And again, we have a video in the show notes that you should go check out. Okay, so let's get to the control surfaces. We have, we'll start with ailerons, and ailerons are found on the trailing edge and outboard side of single engine propeller aircraft. So those are the aircraft that you will train in for general aviation. And the word aileron is actually a French word, which means little wing. So that's convenient. Now imagine the last six inches or so of the wing put on a hinge. So you have the leading edge of the wing, right? So that's towards the front of the aircraft. That's where the air hits that part first. And then you have the trailing edge of the wing. So that's the back side of the wing, closer to the tail. So on that trailing edge, the last six inches or so, if that part of the wing was just kind of able to move, it was put on a hinge and it was able to deflect up or down that last six inches of the wing. So that's basically what ailerons are. It's that little wing, that French word, right? And the purpose of ailerons is to roll the airplane around the Z-axis. So remember we said the Z-axis was if you stuck a roasting stick through your airplane marshmallow straight through the nose, out the tail, and then you rolled it, it would kind of roll around it. The wingtips would go up and down. So that's roll around the Z-axis, and ailerons do that, and this helps it the aircraft to turn. So both the left wing and right wing are connected via the same control rods, and they therefore they move simultaneously. So that the ailerons on the left wing and the ailerons on the right wing, they're all connected. So that when you turn the yoke, so you turn on the yoke left or you turn it right, the right aileron and the left aileron are going to move at the same time. However, they move in opposite direction of one another. So they can only go up and down. And when one aileron goes up, the other one goes down. So for example, if turning left, the pilot will turn the yoke to the left, causing the left aileron to deflect up and the right aileron to deflect down. So the wings and ailerons are designed such that when the aileron deflects up, the wing has less what we call camber, and it's an aeronautical term, and it, it sort of means the, the curvature of the aileron and the aileron, which we'll get to, but the aileron is a cross section of the wing. So if you were at the wingtips, standing at the wingtips of a plane, you were to look right down in line the wing, like from the side, directly up from the side, that shape that the wing is from the side, that cross section of the wing, that's the aileron. 
And when that has more curvature, that's kind of what we're talking about with camber. And so when the aileron deflects up, it kind of ruins that shape, right? The, the shape has now changed, that cross-sectional shape and pattern of the wing changes. So when it deflects up, it has less camber and produces less lift. And then when the aileron deflects down, it kind of has more curvature, right? And so the wing has more camber and produces more lift. And so going back to our example, in a left turn, the left aileron goes up and this causes less lift on the left wing, which causes the left wing to dip down. It's creating less lift. So it's going to fall with gravity, right? So the left wing dips. And when the right aileron goes down at the very same time, remember, they move at the same time when you turn the yoke to the left. In a left turn, this causes more lift on the right wing because the aileron deflected down and you have more curvature, so you get more lift. So now that lift is more than gravity over there, and that causes the right wing to lift up. So at the same time, you're getting the left wing to have less lift and dip, and the right wing to have more lift and rise. And so this effect causes the revolting, the resulting force of lift to turn the aircraft to the left. So you roll around that roll axis, which is down the center of the fuselage, through the nose and out the back of the tail. The left wing dips, the right wing goes, and you kind of see, you can visualize that roll. And again, we have in our video, we can show that visualization of that movement. And also in our course, we have that video and we also have images which show this as well. All right, so that's the ailerons. So while ailerons control the roll of the aircraft, the rudder controls the yaw or movement about the y-axis. Now remember we said the y-axis was a vertical axis. If you just stick that roasting stick through your aircraft marshmallow straight from the top of it, you just stuck it in there and then you rolled it around, the nose would move to the left or right and then the, the tail would follow. So most instructors will tell you to watch the nose of the aircraft relative to a point on the horizon in order to coordinate the yaw of the aircraft. And so a coordinated turn is one that, and we'll get to this, when you turn an aircraft, you get adverse yaw. And so you want to make sure that your yaw is coordinated with your roll when you turn the aircraft. And so that's what the instructor means when they say that, coordinate your turn. So many things can affect the movement of the nose from side to side, aka yaw, including wind, adverse yaw, and then left turning tendencies, which again, we'll get to down the road. And if you're familiar with the rudder of a boat, the rudder of an aircraft is the exact same concept. Rudders are found on the vertical stabilizer on the tail of the aircraft and can be deflected to the left or right. So just like the rudder on a boat, you know, it's vertical in the water. And when you deflect it one way or the other way, it's going to turn the entire boat. The entire boat's going to turn its direction when you change the direction of that rudder. So if you imagine the flow of air over the vertical stabilizer, and then imagine the rudder being deflected to the left. So if we're looking at it, we're looking at the aircraft from the back, from behind it. So from the back of the tail, and that rudder deflects off to the left. The force of the air on the rudder would push the tail of the aircraft to the right. So you have that rudder deflected to the left, and you have air coming by, like shooting past either side of the vertical stabilizer. So when you deflect into the air to the left, the air is going to hit that on the left. And it's going to want to push the tail to the right. And this causes the nose of the aircraft to move to the left, right? Because it's rotating about that roasting stick that's right from the top, right in the middle of our aircraft. So it's rotating around that. So the nose is going to move to the left as the tail gets pushed to the right. Just as the flow of water would force a boat to turn left or right with the rudders of a boat. And then again, I mentioned this before, but rudders and ailerons need to be used in tandem to keep the aircraft coordinated during maneuvers. And when landing in a crosswind, the rudder is particularly important to keep the body of the aircraft aligned with the runway so that when touchdown is made and the wheels are aligned to travel straight down the runway. And again, we'll get to this. So this, if this is a little bit advanced, don't worry. But when you are flying, landing in a crosswind, if you don't do any correction and you're flying, you're aiming at the runway and the wind's to the left, it's going to push your aircraft to the right. So what you have to do is you have to fight the wind and you have to point the nose of the aircraft. You have to basically turn into the wind enough so that you're fighting the wind perfectly so that your path will continue down to the runway. But when you turn into the wind, your wheels are now turned so that when you, if you land on the runway, your wheels are not going to be pointed straight down the runway. 
and you could really damage your aircraft. So what you do then is then you yaw, you use your rudder to turn the nose of the aircraft so then the fuselage is lined up with your runway. And again, we'll get to all this if that's too much, but something to think about and why we coordinate roll with yaw. Okay, next up, we're going to talk about the elevator or stabilator. So the elevator controls the pitch of the aircraft or the rotation about the x-axis. So this axis was our roasting stick stuck through our aircraft marshmallow through one wingtip and out the other wingtip. So when we rotate that, the nose goes up and down and the tail goes up and down in the opposite direction of the nose. An elevator is the hinged part of the trailing edge of the horizontal stabilizer on the tail of the aircraft. So just like the ailerons were the last six or so inches on a hinge of the wing that changed that camber and shape of the wing. Well, the horizontal stabilizer is just a miniature wing. It creates lift on the tail to keep the aircraft balanced and stable in flight. So it's just a miniature wing and the elevator is basically just a miniature aileron. But unlike the ailerons where ailerons, one aileron goes up, the other aileron goes down, the elevators on either side of the horizontal stabilizer, they work the same. So if one goes down, the other side goes down. If one goes up, the other side goes up. But some small aircraft will have a stable later, which is where the entire horizontal stabilizer moves up and down. And this has the same effect. So when elevator goes down, you're increasing the camber on the horizontal stabilizer and you're increasing the lift on it. So that's going to raise the tail. When the elevator deflects up, you're decreasing the camber, it's going to decrease the lift, and the tail is going to go down, causing the nose to go up, okay? So that's how you pitch up and down. Now, when you have a stable later, where the whole thing moves up and down, it's the same thing. So when the stable later moves up, you're increasing that angle, you're increasing the curvature of the wind that has to go over it, and you're increasing the lift on the tail, which will lift up the tail and make the nose drop. Again, because we're rotating about that roasting stick that's through our wings. And then if the stabilator, the leading edge goes down and it tilts down, the whole thing shifts down. Now you have less camber, less curvature that we want, and it's going to have less lift and the tail of the aircraft is going to drop. The nose will rise and that's how you pitch up. So when the pilot pushes the yoke forward, they want to dive. They want to, you know, pitch down. So that when this happens, the elevator deflects downwards. So when you push down on the yoke, when you push forward on the yoke, elevator goes down and the stabilator, if it was a stabilator, would tilt such that the leading edge goes up and the trailing edge goes down. So when we push forward and we want to pitch down, we want more lift on the tail. So we're creating a situation, whether it's the elevator or the stabilator, where we have more lift, more camber on the tail so that the tail has more lift, it rises, and in effect, our nose goes down. And then when the pilot pulls back on the yoke, also referred to as the pilot giving back pressure to the yoke, the elevator or stabilator defects upwards, deflects upwards, and if a stabilator, it tilts such that the leading edge goes down and the trailing edge goes up. Again, we're undoing the camber of the wing. We're creating less lift so that the tail will drop. And then, in effect, the nose at the same time does the opposite, and it goes up. So we pitch up. So when we pull back on the yoke, we pitch up, and the nose goes up. Another way to put this, so when we're pitching up and we're creating less lift on the tail, the horizontal tail, we're essentially, the changing of the elevator or the stabilator is creating a lower angle of attack. That's another way of saying it. I'm talking about camber, but in effect, it's changing that angle of attack. And as you'll see later as angle of attack increases until the critical angle of attack. But as it increases, the lift increases. So if we decrease that angle of attack or decrease the camber as we're doing, it's going to decrease that lift. And then on the opposite side, if we increase that angle of attack when we want to pitch down, so when we push forward on the yoke and the elevator tilts down, we're increasing that angle of attack. We're creating more lift on the tail. So the tail rises and the nose pushes down. Hopefully I've done a good job of explaining what it kind of this looks like and give you that visual picture in your head. But again, we have a video that shows, we have some GIFs in there that show these kind of movements. So go check that out. It's in the show notes. And let's move on to flaps. So flaps are essentially an extension of the wing found on the trailing edge of the wing 
on the inboard side. So they're inboard of the ailerons. That means they're closer to the fuselage. They are controlled by the pilot either electrically or manually. One neutral flaps match the camber of the wings. So they're flush to the shape of the wings and they have no effect. So it's just, they're just flush. They're, they have no effect and the wings are just doing their thing. But when applied by the pilot, they're deflected downward and they're usually in three different settings, 10 degrees, 25 degrees, or 40 degrees. And that's the degrees measured from the normal shape of the wing and that deflection away from that normal shape. And when deflected down, they change the camber and cord line of the wing and increase lift. So we have a visual example. Again, I've sort of been talking about this, but just like the ailerons or the elevator, it changes that general shape, that camber of the airfoil of the wing. And what that does is it changes what another term called the cord line. Cord line is the imaginary line from the leading edge, the tip of the leading edge to the tip of the trailing edge. So when that trailing edge is tilted down, like with flaps or ailerons, that cord line is going to shift down as well. And the angle of attack is our angle between the relative wind and that cord line. So when we lower the flaps, the back of the cord line is going to tilt down and it's going to basically be more inclined with the relative wind. It's going to have a larger angle between the relative wind, which is a larger angle of attack. Again, check out the video so you can visualize that better. So the purpose of flaps is to enable the pilot to make steeper approaches to a landing without increasing airspeed. Remember that for the FAA written exam. The purpose of flaps is to enable the pilot to make steeper approaches to a landing without increasing airspeed. Since the flaps help the wings create more lift, and therefore you don't need as much airspeed. So there's two ways to increase lift, which we'll get to. There airspeed, the more airspeed you have, the more lift you have. And the more angle of attack, the more lift you have. So if we can create the wings to have a higher angle of attack, we don't need as much airspeed. This allows us to approach the ground at a lower airspeed, but still be able to glide in and have enough lift to glide in and not just drop out of the sky. So that's the purpose of flaps. So you can come down with reduced airspeed and land. And this increase in lift means a lower stall speed, which is particularly handy when landing, when you want the aircraft to be flying as slow as possible so that you can gently touch down on the ground. So that stall speed, you don't want to go below that or you'll stall. So when you deploy the flaps, it lowers the stall speed, which allows you again to fly slower without stalling. Sort of what I was saying earlier, you'll continue to provide lift and you won't stall. Flaps lower the stall speed simply by the fact that you don't need as high of an angle of attack in order to achieve the same amount of lift because the flaps are changing that angle of attack for you. When the flaps are extended and the wing camber and cord line changes, the effective angle of attack is reduced, as I said. So that is flaps. Now let's move on to trim tabs. On most small aircraft, there are two types of trim. Elevator trim, which we have an image here in the ground school of an aircraft, and we have kind of color-coded these different trim tabs. So this is the, the red one in this image here in the online ground school to give you a, a visual of that. And then rudder trim, which is the green trim here on the rudder. However, some aircraft even have aileron trim tabs, which are the blue trim tabs in the image you're looking at in the ground school. The purpose of trim is to relieve pilots of the need to maintain constant pressure on the flight controls. The trim tabs, and I'm doing tabs in quotes, as they are called, are basically mini elevators or mini rudders that can be controlled electrically or manually by the pilot. The best way to explain their use is by an example. For elevator trim, you may have an aircraft loaded heavily in the back such that your CG is moved back and wants to make the aircraft constantly pitch up. Instead of the pilot having to add constant forward pressure, you know, pushing the yoke forward, the pilot can instead trim forward so that the trim tab extends down and has the effect of pitching down. Another more common scenario is simply keeping the aircraft in straight and level flight at different airspeeds and power settings. Each aircraft was designed to fly straight and level in a specific set of atmospheric conditions, aircraft loading, power setting, and airspeed. So if you want to fly the aircraft at 2000 RPM, about 75% full power on something like a Cherokee Warrior, but you don't want to descend or climb and you don't want to have to constantly pitch up, 
then you can set the trim tab and reduce your workload. Student pilots are often taught in a traffic pattern to use the trim tab to get all trimmed up at the correct airspeed and RPM they want in the traffic pattern, which reduces their workload for their landing. So just a common usage of the trim tab is when you get up you know, into cruise, you can trim there, or when you're flying in a pattern. All right, now let's move on to spoilers. Just a quick couple things about spoilers, what they are. Spoilers are high drag devices that assist an aircraft in slowing down and losing altitude without gaining extra speed. Spoilers are common on gliders and some high speed aircraft. So it's not always common on the single engine prop trainer aircraft that you're going to fly, but we still may be asked about something like a spoiler. Spoilers are usually found on each wing and used at the same time. However, spoilers can also be used only on one wing to induce a rolling motion. Spoilers are generally found above the flaps and extend the opposite as flaps, upwards and into the free stream air, spoiling the airflow. So flaps extend downwards, spoilers will extend upwards and spoil that airflow again they're to increase drag and assist the aircraft in slowing down and losing the altitude. When you're, if you're flying commercial, you will see the spoilers kind of flip up. These little flaps flip up above the flaps and above the wing when you come in for landing because you're trying to slow the aircraft down as quickly as possible on landing, especially those big commercial jets. All right, that has been the lesson on flight controls. Thank you everyone for tuning in this week to the Audio Ground School podcast. We will continue with both releasing IFR ground school lessons on Mondays and private pilot ground school lessons on Wednesdays. And next week for private pilot, we are going to be looking and talking about aircraft lights. So we'll see you guys next week.